Hi everyone, and welcome to the final real lecture of 2020. We hope you're ready for another thought-provoking lecture. And firstly, we'd like to acknowledge the Wadawarrung people of the Kulin Nation and pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Tonight's guest is Dr. Philip Roos. And tonight, Dr. Roos will be taking us through a lecture entitled A New Pattern Language, Regenerative Adaptive Design for Architects as part of this trimester's overarching theme of sustainability. Dr. Roos is uh, known internationally as a leader in environmental design. He's an ecological systems inspired architect, designer, planner, and strategist for regenerative architecture, sustainable urban developments, infrastructure, and landscapes. He's the director of the Live Smart Research Laboratory at the School of Architecture and Built Environment at Deakin University. And his research interests are centered on the human nature re uh, relationship, biophilia, and the identification of optimized design processes based on a regenerative adaptive design and pattern language system. In professional practice, he's been working as a design professional for over 30 years on an extensive range of small to large scale projects in Europe, Africa, and Australasia. His work is influenced by whole systems thinking and his application of environmental design is closely related to the ordering of the large scale aspects of the environment by means of architecture, engineering, landscape architecture, biophilic design, urban design, and ecological planning. Before we get started, as this is possibly the first lecture for many of our visitors tonight, I'll explain who we are and why we initiate these lectures. The real lectures are a series of student organized industry lectures featuring practicing architects and industry professionals. The real lectures have been run at Deakin University for over 10 years and were established to pursue engaging, topical and thought-provoking architectural discourse between those in the field and those studying. As architecture students or those simply interested in architecture, we're aware of the service level discussion in architectural media and in the general public. So the curation of the real lecture series aims to explore beyond that service level discussion and delve into a deeper conversation about the built environment. You can stay up to date with us on Facebook and Instagram and also on our blog, and if you'd like to see more of the real lectures, you can also see previously recorded lectures on our Facebook page and the blog. And uh, without any further ado, I'll hand over to Phil. Um, thank you, Robbie. Um, let me just share my screen. I think it's shared. Okay, there we go. I, I just want to thank you everyone um, to give me this um, opportunity to deliver this lecture tonight um, titled A New Pattern Language Regenerative Adaptive Design for Architects. Um, this um, lecture is based on a uh, book that is recently published with the similar title and um, before I go into um, discussing that I would also just want to um, um, acknowledge and pay my respect to the elders, the families and the forebears of the Wadawurrung people, the traditional custodians of the lands and the waters upon which this lecture tonight is occurring. To Aboriginal elders in the audience, as well as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island peoples of the Australian continent, um, islands and adjacent seas who remain the spiritual and cultural custodians of their lands and waters and who continue to practice their values, languages, beliefs and customs. And I think personally, I would say thank you for the privilege to share this beautiful country um, where I live and practice. I also want to acknowledge many other people that have made major contributions to my thinking and worldview. It is a result of a lifetime of professional practice and many years of research. From the perspective of the whole that I will talk about later, one can see that the thoughts in this lecture is a framing and integration of knowledge by many others over the decades. I am grateful to all those great thinkers upon whose work my research and practice is built, with special mention to Christopher Alexander, Ian McHark, John Tolman Lyle, and Edward O. Wilson. Further, I acknowledge with sincere appreciation and pay my respects 
to many great thinkers and contributors to the theory of pattern languages, such as Nico Salangaros, Michael Mahaffey, and Hayo Nais, amongst others. And I also want to apologize in advance that I don't mention each individual that is contributing immensely to this field. I want to say emerging field, but it is not emerging. It's there for many, many, many years. And it's actually pattern languages as part of the evolutionary process. So we probably could think that it's there for 3.8 billion years or more. A little bit about me. Um, I started, I basically grew up in an architect's practice, if I can say that, in the office of uh, an architect. Uh, my parents died when I was about 16 years old, and um, I need to go and live with my sister that's 20 years older than me. So I was a little bit of a, a youngster um, in the family, and um, her husband was an architect, Victor Sprite. Um, and for living with them, I wanted to contribute because I was a bit of a stroppy guy in my young days. Um, and I said, well, I'll go and work weekends at some shops or perhaps do coffee and so on. And he said, no, you can come and work in my office, do some artworks here and there. Uh, perhaps I teach you a little bit of drawing, um, but you can do it after school or weekends. And then, then that would be your contribution. Now, I'm forever indebtful to Victor because I grew up with an understanding what it means to do architecture that is responsible and also work with the environment. Because one of his fundamental principles was that you always need to work with the environment. And where I grew up in the savannah bushlands of South Africa, we, we were close to nature. And every weekend when I visit the farms, um, I always were fascinated about what nature itself is and what happens there. And I guess that's where my love for nature come from. Now, um, as Robbie were mentioned, there's quite a lot of work that I've done in the, over the last 30 years. But um, just to frame a little bit of some of my work so that you not all think I'm just an academic and write stuff. Um, I just want to um, show you a few examples um, where I got involved in projects. But what is interesting is this wasn't designed up front, um, regulated fully by planning controls and building controls. The first one is Africa House um, in this picture of my dear old friend Kingsley Holgate. He invited me to come and help him change and renovate the existing house. But what was interesting is this whole fundamental principles of a pattern language, how things organically grow in morphogenic sequences just work, not by design and draw it, by, but actually do living structures and create a place that's got soul as in his house. As hard as I could try to do new drawings and convince him about some great design ideas I had, we work through this morphological process, creating amazing space and livable spaces in this house, as you can see in these pictures. Um, I didn't know about pattern language those days. And only later years, about 2006, 2008, I first um, were introduced in the work of Alexander. And that's when I realized that what I experience and believe in it's really close to what I think architecture needs to do. Now, if you look at these images, this place got soul. It's living. Um, it's not a modern glass steel structure that is dead. Um, and I know I'm going to get in trouble because I talked about modern architecture like this. But I think we lost that connection to place if we don't work with place and the people of the place and the environment. Another quick project or another small one is Nether Soul House. A few scribbles that I've got there where we changed the house and um, improved uh, some extra bedrooms and do a whole extra wing to this house. But what is interesting for this project for me, um, if you can look at it, you can see how it fits totally into the environment and respect the environment and it's to scale. 
And then a very interesting one is St. Quasi Lodge, a guest house that was also our home um, and um, that I designed and built with uh, my bare hands and, and six guys that I trained from the street. And this place evolved through into amazing um, place that's got soul. Um, and my architecture partner in 2008, Tiki Klawinski, um, I had my own practice, but we joined to do quite a few projects together. And something that was really interesting, when he said to me, he said, Phil, this place, it's like it moves from one organic process to the other, and it is like it's alive. And I would have never get that right if I had to just design this and think that I can do it without being on site and work with the site. So that's what this lecture is really about. It's about this, I call it regenerative adaptive processes that happened. This was really small scale um, um, projects. They'd respond to the climate, they adapt to changes, but we need to do this at a major big scale. And this lecture tonight is really about how to rethink the way we design and build our cities regions, neighborhoods, and places where we live, to be able to achieve a sustainable and resilient future, both for us as humans, but also also to be part and help the natural world to achieve a resilient future. During this lecture, I will draw information from my new or my latest book, Regenerative Adaptive Design for Sustainable Development, a pattern language approach that's published by Springer and pre-orders is available on the link that you can see there. Um, in this book, I propose a new theory for design and planning based on the fundamentals of pattern languages, regenerative design and ecological stewardship. And I would start this discussion to go back to the very well-known debate between Christopher Alexander and Peter Eisenman um, in 1982. This legendary debate took place at the Graduate School of Design, Harvard University on November 17th. Not long before it, Alexander had given a talk on the nature of order. That is his four volume um, uh, publication, a phenomenal piece of work which was to become the subject of his magnum opus of architectural philosophy, um, as stated um, in online in Catastrophe num number three. The original version was envisioned quite less smaller, but it grew um, into something unique as his architectural philosophy. What happened, Eisenman read um, that before, or some of the information, and then this talk become, or the debate, it was supposed to be a discussion, become a debate between what is um, the new paradigm of architecture. Alexander would base his um, discussions on the nature of order and uh, Peter Eisen, um, um, Eisenman based his discussion on distract uh, modernism, and uh, deconstructivism. Really the fundamental of this debate was about living structures versus deconstructivism. Now many um, modern architects, contemporary architects will say that their work are not de deconstructivism, but would argue that a lot of the work that happens today is, is really, um, in such a context that it is more deconstructive than that it's actually creating living environments. If we can just look at these two examples, um, I look, I'm, I'm putting up here the ANZ Gothic Bank, Melbourne. Um, doesn't matter if you're a modernist, if, you, if, you're, if you're a, a technology geek, um, you go into Melbourne and you go to these buildings, you, you feel good, you actually, find it interesting. You don't understand why you're attracted to the beauty of these buildings. 
Unfortunately, many of our modern buildings, that doesn't happen. And this is part, was part of Christopher Alexander's work for over 30, 40 years to identify what is it that gives some structures a quality. The fundamentals is really simple between living structures and non-living structures. In living structures, it is creative. And it is, there's beauty in non-living structures as you, that is destructive. It is monotonous. Um, to be honest, if I look at these buildings, um, they don't do anything for me. They actually don't create life. They feel dead. But if I look at this place where there's organic um, forms and there's nature has been embedded and there's a lot of um, um, uh, uh, formations of different patterns, um, it triggers a sense of well-being in us. And this has actually been proven now by um, further studies in biophilia and how biophilic design actually creates a sensory reaction. And I call that sensory architecture. So living structures on the one hand and is enhance our health and well-being. Non-living structures, on the other hand, promote ill health and ill being. Now, I know there's many people that can argue with me or against me on this, but we've got a living proof now that our environment is going backwards. We destroying and we take up all the resources of our earth, but we also have really major physiological and psychological health and well-being issues in our cities. And my argument is, is because of this non-living structures that's been created. So on the one hand, we've got biophilia, that means love for nature. And on the other hand, we create this world that re results in biophobia. It's how many people in cities don't even know what is out in nature? So, and you want to avoid to be part of nature. So we're creating a culture, an environment that is not good for us and for the environment. So the fundamentals come down to the word beauty. Um, what is beauty? Beauty true beauty is embedded in living structures. Nature is full of living structures that create wholeness. Now, wholeness is a very important word. If you look at this picture, um, that's the perfect structure of the copper amethyst African daisy. Um, there's balance. Um, it's got geometric forms. Um, there's repetition. Um, there's organic formations in there. There's sort of, there's a structure that is living. Doesn't matter who you are, you would love, we do love flowers. We're always intrigued by the different sizes of flowers, how they fit, how they, how the structures are, how they look like, how they smell. So nature is full of these living structures. That is beauty. Now, if there's beauty in nature, why can't we bring that beauty into our built environment? And that creates wellness if we can do it. So just to bring it into context, part of fundamentals is that the perceived quality of life in buildings or beauty and spaces come from the geometry, the form of structure on all scales and their coherence, not one scale, not too large scale, not simple one glass facade, if I can say that, but it's about on the beauty is in the structure on all scales and their coherence. And how the geomet geometry connects to the individual, to the person that used that space. It also catalyzes interactions between people and the environment, as mentioned by Southern Gardens. And if you look at um, these pictures that I took at Lamu Archipelago in East Africa of an old um, um, city or town that's um, now in ruins, but you can see that these structures is just phenomenal. And it's even though there is no people living there anymore, when you're in here, you feel that it's alive. And, and that is where I try to wonder how could we find an architecture 
that can create living structures. Um, one of the key elements of that is because of fractals. Fractals form a language because it is repetitive and um, it's like notes and music. It's the way we talk. Um, there's, a, there's, there's a repetition and there is a really um, um, noticeable um, um, element in fractals and it's across nature. So fractals play a vital role in forming the, the fabric of our universe. Um, it is not only present in mountains, soils, rocks, rivers, plants and trees, clouds in the sky, but it is present in ancient civilizations across the world that mimic this cosmic design. Generative codes representing geomorphological sequences in this traditional vernacular architecture and creates a form language uh, that formed them part of these civilizations. And if any of you um, read um, um, Eglash's book, um, and he referred to the Balai village, it's amazing how these fractals go from um, settlements to bold form, to symbols, um, to clothing, to beadwork in the hair. And all of these things connect us then with the place, and that place is that environment. And this is bring me to indigenous traditional architecture. And I'm talking a little bit later about indigenous knowledge, but every traditional architecture has its own form language. And more accurately, it's got a group of languages that evolves with variations over time and locality. And what is so important is that these languages that's been created by this traditional architecture or vernacular arch architecture um, also connects to the material culture of it, but it's a form language that we see. So as architects, this is these days, we all think about form and how a place look like, but that is only the form language that needs to, then it needs to connect and blend with a pattern language that's part of that place and how things evolve over time and how it's actually going to evolve in the future. And this is where um, you can see, I keep on quoting at Salengados, Alexander, because there's phenomenal work that show this is the type of things that bring um, life to our environments. Um, environments that we can enjoy and live and work in. So I raise this then that we need to actually create, need to create a unified architectural theory that's linked to nature. So if architecture, and we know architecture is a human act that invades and displaces the natural ecosystem. Biological order is destroyed every time we clear native plant growth and erect buildings and infrastructure in its place. Logically then, architecture has to have a theoretical basis that begins with the natural um, ecosystem. That means architecture is indeed linked to biology. And when it's linked to biology, we will understand this perceived we will perceive a kingship between different processes of nature and ourselves. And this is where that connection that I'm talking about, where we could perceive this kingship, where they come with respect into it. Um, and that is called biphilia. Biphilia is the human nature relationship. Um, according to Edward L. Wilson and Kellett, um, by filia is the innately emotional affiliation of human beings to other living organisms. Innate means hereditary and hence part of an ultimate human nature. So I'm asking the question, if we currently destroy our natural environments because of our bolt practice, not just because we interfere in a place and destroy what there is, but also we take all resources away. We take, we need resources millions of miles away, thousands of miles away to help build this new urban growth. I mean, we biggest problem these days is urbanization. It's one of our biggest trends. Um, and because of urbanization and live in cities, we need these resources. 
we actually destroy those ecosystems. But what if we can have an architecture that's inherited part of nature and we can create, that's got a form that it creates that support living structure, an architecture that's responsible. I think so it's possible to have it. And this is where I named this the architecture for life. And that put me on a journey in my path of research. Um, after many years, I'm not very long in academia. I think it's only four years, but I was invest. I need to investigate what can the architecture for life do? Where can we create places that's more sustainable and livable and actually an architecture for life that that can create living structures. So it moves from the, that's where the pattern language came in. It's, um, Alexander's work of the nature of order, where it really look at morphogenic sequences. Um, that is supported by the evolutionary processes of emergence and the principles of urban structure by Salangaros. I advise you all, if you didn't read these books before, it is, you, you need to read it to understand and to actually also get to a point to realize what is your responsibility to this planet. Um, but these books are the ones that influence my thinking. Um, from our love for nature, if, if we are part of nature, why are we destroying it? So Edward Old Wilson work, work on biphilia and Kellett's and his work on the biphilia hypothesis help us to understand how important that link is. And then nature as a higher power. Cohen, um, that's an eco-psychologist, um, oh, sorry, Cole, that's an eco-psychologist, took this a bit further and what I find interesting is the senses. We've got sensory connections to everything around us. Now, how can we take these sensory connections, all of this knowledge that we've got, and we can create an architecture for life that becomes responsible? Um, I walk in many, and you can probably agree with me, you will walk in some buildings and we'll see some urban environments where it's cold and it's dead, in some places you'll go in, you love it, and it's got soul, and you know that this is sustainable. So that is architecture for life. But if we want to do this on a big scale, because we need it urgently, um, I don't know if you saw um, um, the recent do documentary um, that is talking about um, how we need to look after the earth. and to do this requires a major shift in our thinking. So from that introduction, I'm going to ask you this question. When you look at this picture, what do you see? Um, that is our planet. Um, it is whole. It is one integrated system. It's also referred to as Gaia, uh, James Lovelock put forward the Gaia theory. And the Gaia theory say that everything is interconnected and it's a self-regulating system. That is the only planet we know that life exists in that vast universe. Now, interesting, Ian McHarg um, put this up to his students um, a lot of times when he started his lectures and said, if you look at this, it's a beautiful revolving sphere. Um, and it is beautiful, but there is blotches, dark and brown blotches. And these blotches are the cities of man. And these blotches are just that, a planetary disease. We know today that's the case. We need to turn that around. So my argument is, in the first instance, we need a dynamic and major shift that requires a new worldview and to move to a sustainable thinking and sustainable design thinking that's based in an integral system. As noted by Decay, this change and shift to integral awareness where cultural, psychological, um, physical, and mental references 
are based on an ecological thinking um, system that sees the world in one main system that constantly evolves and is able to create wholeness. So that's where I come to a regenerative adaptive pattern language. A regenerative adaptive pattern language um, for sustainable development is very complex. And I cannot talk about all of that tonight, but this is one of the diagrams that um, um, indicating the method of implementing the regenerative adaptive pattern language thinking. Um, as you could see, um, place to evolve and take care of place, there's many things we need to do, especially if we think it on how to do it through evolutionary process. Um, I've developed a regenerative adaptive design model that works with adaptive planning design processes, um, an equation that's based on previous work of many great um, thinkers before my time that I note the notion of regenerative adaptive patterns. But what this do is it investigate in depth um, sets of forces that influence a place, uh, place settings, uh, transformations, and so forth. But what I'll talk tonight about, and I just want to bring this up, is the higher fundamental patterns. Now, as you know, in Alexander's book, there's uh, more than 250 odd patterns. Um, there's a new book that's been brought out by Michael Mahaffey. Um, he's called it a new pattern language for growing regions. He's got 80, 80 patterns within this pattern language, the regenerative adaptive pattern language. There's core patterns, there's morphogenic sequences, and all these things you need to implement to really. Um, be part of a evolving system system where of place. Um, so I'm just going to touch base on the hierarchy, on the higher level patterns, and I call them, or I also refer to them as the um, the patterns of strategy, the patterns of initiation, of bigger thinking that we can change things. And they are these few that's been shown on top here. Um, the well integral sustainable worldview and so on. And we'll go to them now. So the first pattern, fundamental pattern is the whole. So the world, the whole means wholeness as we looked at that earth before the biosphere. And this pattern statement is that the universe, the earth, the biosphere, the biotic and abiotic matter, sentient beings along with all other systems and parts constitute a complex unity of networks, an organized coherent system of many parts, fitting and working together as one. To create wholeness and making up the whole, this whole works together. All living systems are part of a larger interconnected whole and are part of an integral existence. So as if you, if you know pattern languages and how it works, the statement then means, therefore, if we want to move beyond a damaging anthropogenic dominant nature destructive society, we need to consider this whole, not just the parts, but we need to consider this whole whenever we make any design decisions. And if we want to do sustainable development, that is sustainable or regenerate it. How do we do that? Well, it's complex. And the integral sustainable design thinking by Dr. K, and that's based on integral theory, help us to pull all of these complexities together. Um, in this diagram, if you, it looks at the key perspectives that we need to consider any time that we think of interfering with any place or do anything somewhere on this earth. The first one is the behaviors perspective. That is the what of the individual parts. It's about, um, about how we put these two things together to make the whole. The second one is the systems perspective. It is the how of the complex whole. Then it's the experience perspective. 
the who that intends, thinks and feels. Uh, and that is where I think our well-being comes in because we a lot of times forget about how we feel and how we actually react to a place because we just design for functions, not for feeling. And this is where sensory architecture comes in and it's very important. And then the other one is the cultural is culture's perspective is the why of the whole collective of we. Um, so deep sustainability goes beyond the mere aspects of resource efficiency, energy reduction and sustainable growth. And if I look at this um, four spheres of the or four quadrants of integral sustainable design, I fully support what Alexander said, um, that deep sustainability addresses um, the emotional, the spiritual, the cultural connections of people with the built and the natural environment. And it's about the ends rather than the means to an end. And this is where sustainability needs to go beyond what we do. It's these other dynamics that's critically important. Pattern number two, fundamental pattern number two then, therefore ask us or state that we need to achieve a resilient and sustainable future by adopting integral sustainable design practices at multiple levels of complexity and scale. But we in environment, and as we know, we in a drastic state where the Earth's climate is changing. Um, we've got ecosystems that's diminishing. Um, we've got resources that's running out. So pattern, fundamental pattern number three, put it forward that climate change co-adaptation needs to happen. Now, what does that mean? Changes on Earth operate at middle, middle, multiple levels of intricacy and takes place in dynamic social, economic, technological, biophysical, and political um, context. Unfortunately, we got the human layer, and that brings in political context. Um, I'm not a politician, luckily not, but I think one of the major issues of, of our time it's driven by economic and political gain. And um, we need to change this because we've got only one planet. We need to co-adapt with these changes that's coming. So due to anthropogen anthropogenic influences, um, the climate and ecological systems are changing rapidly. So therefore, we, we need as humans to adapt practices that co-adapt with nature. And we need to see if we can find ways that nature, we can assist nature to adapt um, in a sustainable and resilient uh, way. That brings me to fundamental pattern number four, affinity to water. It seems a little bit out of context at the higher level of the pattern language, but fundamentally, we are always attracted to water. And what's happening today is that most of our developments and city growth happens on coastal areas or close to water. So I found it critical that we need to understand this affinity to water and what this pattern instructs us to do. So in many, in any new human settlement along the coast, especially and next to water bodies, we should acknowledge the complex dynamics of coastal and water systems and investigate the biophysical characteristics, characteristics and the social ecological systems. Why social ecological? Because as soon as we add water, it becomes a social context where we use it for recreation. We need to understand this interface between human and nature systems and, and look at the new, more biodiverse and rich environment for a sustainable future. So affinity to water, um, if you read in the book, there's quite a lot of detailed explanation is that we need to understand all of these systems and integrate it with our own thinking. I mentioned earlier, um, 
how indigenous cultures um, designs are so much connected to the land. I think, and this pattern inform us, and I, I think I may I noted this as advanced indigenous knowledge. And fortunately, in our scientific world or in our Western world and our thinking, indigenous knowledge is not seen as advanced, but fundamentally it is advanced. A lot of work recently or a lot of research or a lot of movements these days is if you look at um, try to adapt with climate change and so forth, um, is we looking, we start to look at indigenous knowledge. How does it work? Because we need we try to find answers. Now, fundamental pattern number five, advanced indigenous knowledge, put it right at the forefront as on a higher level hierarchy of the scale in this language, is when any human settlement is considered, we must first obtain from the local indigenous custodians a deep knowledge of the land and a longer term history of human and landscape interaction. Because it is this long term knowledge that will let us know that we, what to do in this, this landscape. And sometimes that we must not interfere with that landscape. And if we want to have a resilient future and understand adaptation, why not talk, go to the, the knowledge bearers of thousands of years of changing climates and adaptation? So indigenous knowledge is critical for us to build a resilient future. But also, this needs to be dealt with with respect and the knowledge must be dealt with respect. And uh, I urge anyone that when we deal with indigenous knowledge, that that is sacred many times it's sacred knowledge so but it is i think it's critical to understand and find that knowledge and work with our indigenous peoples across the world our first nations peoples our native peoples to understand how to respond to a climate and the environment the next one then because this connection of the country or land is so important is our love for nature. Um, pattern number six told us or instruct us or inform us, if I rather can say that, that the positive enhancement of connections between humans and the natural environment is fundamental to the health and well being of a global society. So, therefore, we need to employ by filia to connect people to nature at physical, psychological, and consciousness levels. We need to engage in a deep holistic nature language that emphasizes our love for nature. And you see, I'm talking about a nature language. It's a complex system that we need to look at um, and respect, again, nature, rather than just to use the resources. Nature's design, pattern number seven, uh, nature is full of marvels. Everything in nature is interconnected through a vast web string network that works together to promote life. And it's like I just explained that previous um, picture of the African daisy. Um, nature reveals itself in a processing, in the process containing intrinsic forms and languages and structures. So if we can understand these different layers from geology right up to the plants, the animals, and the human inhabitants, um, we can use nature's systems and design places for resilience based on um, ecological thinking. Very important for us for a sustainable future. Fundamental pattern eight, go the step further and say, well, we know that we destroy ecosystems currently. We need to be regenerative. So we need to think of regenerative ecosystems. This is where regenerative design comes in. Regenerative design engages the input-output cycle. It considers processes that restore, renew, um, revitalize their own sources of energy and materials thereby creating sustainable and I perhaps say resilient systems. So beyond a baseline approach, design of human nature ecosystems 
as co co spatial processes will underlie living processes for us to create this co evolution that I'm talking about that hopefully will give us a holistic regenerative adaptive structure for the future. And you will note I'm talking about regenerative adaptive design or pattern languages. Um, as I argue that regeneration or regenerative in essence is not necessarily adaptive. Um, and adaptation is not necessarily in itself regenerative. So if we look at how nature work and evolves, it is regenerative and adaptive. Can we apply these to our design thinking? So therefore, to understand the regenerative processes of this whole system, we need to go back and think of pattern, fundamental pattern number one, the whole, how all these systems of the earth works together. Transformation of wholeness, pattern number nine, um, it's about that unfolding of nature's wholeness. That flower, um, the words that Christopher Alexander pro talk about, the unfolding of morphogenetic sequences. Um, the rule of centers, those that are familiar with his work, um, centers is crucial in understanding how we can go through processes of, of, of um, living structures and design to create the regeneration. But regeneration can only happen if we understand the wholeness. And um, this drawing um, is based on, on, on showing for us that process of growth um, and the regeneration processes. So what is that regeneration, um, the transformation of wholeness that we need to understand to bring into our design and planning um, of environments? Pattern number 10 is the notion of regenerative adaptive patterns. And that's the main picture that I had up. Um, it is a bit complex. It's an equation that I developed to, to help us to apply this complex thinking. In nature, there is no singular climax state. Um, to the contrary, it's always dynamic. Um, with patterns of generative processing occurring and reoccurring in this response to forces of change. Now, this is where um, previous pattern languages could be seen as being static. Um, the biggest challenge we've got is because of a changing environment, a changing planet. So how can we deal with this forces of change where it's a dynamic pattern language and dynamic responses of design, planning, and, and, and creating. Um, and I attempt through the notion of regenerative adaptive patterns equation to address these forces. Um, way too complex to, to de describe here, but um, it's about um, it's increasing the connection of richness and everything that happens. And some of you will recognize um, that little sketch um, that comes from just the formation. If you start to draw and organically you create this form, um, that is what happens in nature. What is that scientific side of it? Can we capture it and bring it into our design and planning thinking? Evolutionary adaptation, fundamental pattern. The Earth is a constant, in a constant state of change to calibrate conditions for life through evolutionary adaptation. Um, you, they, 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 it is evident that it's there for millions of years, billions of years. Now, if this evolutionary adaptation happened, and we understand how that works. If we understand how Gaia do, do her work, how does Mother Earth deal with changes and impacts? Can we align our human interventions and settlements with nature? Because nature know how to adapt and survive and be part of this evolutionary process. Now, we can't probably do it for the whole Earth, but we are place-based. So I'm living here in St. Leonard's 
what is the evolutionary processes of this place? How does this fit in my environment around me? The regional context, the national context or continental context, and then the earth systems. So ultimately, if we understand evolutionary adaptation, fundamental pattern number 11 ask us that we need to think again about the whole and any intervention we do need to be ultimately achieve resilience for both humans and the natural environment. Then the last fundamental pattern, um, high level one, um, is Gaia's revenge, fundamental pattern number 12. Um, that's also the last chapter in my book, which pattern aligns with a chapter in the book. So for more than 4 billion years, I mentioned earlier 3.8 billion, but there's a bit of more argument now. Is it 3.8 or 4 billion years? Um, the earth has regulated itself. Providing conditions for life. Gaia is now responding to anthropogenic induced global climate change. Um, we see it happening. Um, I talked to farmers recently. Um, I talked to some indigenous people recently. And every, especially elders, people with gray hair and gray beards, um, saw major changes. There is a change. So Gaia is regulating and responding to this impact that we have on the climate. Um, Gaia is changing her climate to restore this equilibrium of conditions of life. Um, it always happened. We, if we look through this, the ice ages and then life starts again. Therefore, I think that Gaia will re-regulate itself. So the question is, we need to embrace, or what this pattern asks us to do, is that we need to embrace the whole and implement a regenerative adaptive pattern language that we celebrate the living earth and avoid impending consequences. There is time to actually work with earth. Like Edward Old Wilson said, um, if we sit, and that's potentially impossible currently, but if we could get our wild areas back, 50% of the earth being given back to wild nature, it will be able to totally rehabilitate and reestablish itself. So in conclusion, um, I love this quote by Christopher Alexander. And as academics, we always tune things a bit and we add things. Um, so there's a bit of some of my words in there. But fundamentally, this is a, a, um, a, a comment by him. And in conclusion, I will just want to read this uh, to you. It said, if we hope, so this in the brackets is my words that come in. Um, but what he said and what the quote says, it said, if we hope to bring our towns and buildings back to life, we must begin to recreate our own regenerative languages in such a way that all of us can use them with the patterns I say connected to nature, in them so intense, so full of life again, that these languages will almost of its own accord begin to sing. To work our way toward a shared and living language once again, we must first learn how to discover patterns which are deep and capable of regenerating life. Um, thank you. Adopted and mended from Christopher Alexander. Um, to work. Thanks, Phil. That was brilliant. Um, now, we've got a couple of questions from the audience that have been sent in to us as well. Uh, so, as usual, I'll get Katie to help me read out some of them. Thanks so much, Dr. Ruth. That was great. Um, I'm going to start with just if you had any ideas about this comment. Um, one of your colleagues in the industry, Dr. Mary Jane Walker, who, who I think you've, uh, you, you guys have 
worked together before in different ways, um, was quoted in a recent Age article on the topic of um, becoming a biophilic city as, quote, Melbourne is too big now, but Geelong has the right scale, end quote. Do you share this opinion about the potential or lack of each of the cities becoming potentially biophilic? Um, so, yes and no. Um, when so any city can become biophilic if it's been if it adapts the principles. But the issue is when cities um, like New York, for example. Um, I mean, if we, I mean, Melbourne is not as big as New York, but there's there's some areas that can become biophilic, um, and we and biophilic design can be included. Um, but at scale, I mean, Geelong, where our campus is based, it's got the best. I agree with Mary Jane, hundred percent there that the city of Geelong has got the opportunity to become a biophilic city because the scale is right and the time is right to interfere with its growth. It's not as big as Melbourne. Um, Melbourne is, is, is many, many, many times bigger. So I think the city of Melbourne, we can probably make areas biophilic, uh, but as a recognized as a biophilic city, so there's the biophilic cities network that's been run by Professor Timothy Beatley. Um, he done a fantastic forward in my book. So please go and read it. Um, is that we, uh, to, 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 to tick the boxes to be able to certify this as a biophilic city, I think Melbourne will really struggle to do that. Um, but Geelong's got the opportunity to grow into a biophilic city. And I think Geelong's council members, and I don't hope I'm talking out of, uh, <laughs> out of proportion here, or what you say, out of, um, <laughs> out of my 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 position but uh, i think there's a lot of uh geelong members city members that is actually supportive of this and i think they can make it happen so i hope they will embrace this um we would have had uh, professor timothy beatley here last year to visit and um, do some lectures and work with um, the city of geelong and and also we would have gone up to other ballarat and other cities to talk about how we can change these cities into biophilic cities, but because of um, COVID and other issues, he can't come. Um, but yeah, um, I, Mary Jane's got it uh, right. By Geelong's got the opportunity way ahead than Melbourne. Okay, um, I've got a question here from Robert uh, for you, Phil. Um, what do you think about creating a worldwide single website of the pattern language like Wikipedia, where all Alexander and Mahaffey and your patterns are included and everybody can contribute with their own patterns? That's a great idea. Um, and there is already a website that addresses Alexander's patterns and um, I think it's called living structures or the living building um, structures. Um, now I'm talking under correction, but um, they, it, it's probably needed. It's, it's like Wikipedia to have a patternpedia <laughs> could be actually something amazing. And then and, and by all means, my work is, is I'm humbled. My work is, um, is probably, um, just touching the surface, there's so many other work by Mahafi and Sonny Garros and all these people. Um, and and the Alexander's, all his colleagues. Um, we, but yeah, that's a good idea. So what I could say, well, perhaps let's start one. <laughs> yeah, sounds like, a, sounds like a good idea. Um, okay, I was going to touch on the, uh, Melbourne Metro Tunnel Project, just because it seems topical and, and semi-current, apart from the, the COVID pandemic at the moment. Um, and I was going to ask about, in your role as the, as you said earlier, you're the technical advisor, and you say you're technically advising some works, and, uh, and um, within the research team for the Creating Healthy Places study, um, I was wondering if you might like to reflect on this project 
uh, as like the impact of biophilic design in, in that large scale and um, maybe some barriers or if you did face any barriers with your colleagues in making these recommendations or, or providing advice? Oh, you want to get me in trouble? No. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> what have I done? <laughs> um, no, it's all good. Um, so, first of all, um, there's a great bunch of people at the previous Melbourne Metro Rail Authority that's now part of uh, Public Transport Victoria. Um, yes, the biophilic design, uh, creating healthy places was the study of the research to inform yes. actually biophilic design guidelines for the railway station. And these were issued to the proponents and the architects and the team to actually try to implement that. Um, I'm not at this stage where I don't know where they're at and how they implemented, but or if they how much of that they implemented. So I hope that that's been adopted, embraced, and that we're going to see that those biophilic design guidelines um, have been adopted. What I do know is that as part of the whole process to make better places, the stations is not just concrete boxes, it's that um, the sustainability team of the MMRA make sure that this is part of all the targets and the criteria to be met. Um, but what is the barriers? I think that is probably, that's why I say you're gonna get me in trouble. Um, <laughs> That lot of the stuff of that project is still confidential as it's been because it's been built. So the barriers that we find embracing new thinking like this um, come fundamentally down to behavioral, behavioral and attitude and people's perception of things. Um, not that it's impossible to implement these. It is just that. Um, we people are so used to do the status quo and don't want to go that little bit extra and pushing the boundaries. I think that's the barriers. So, um, and, and, and many of the projects I work with, the barriers come up when we try to push beyond standard practice. Um, it's been called best practice, sustainable design. For example, Green Star certification. I think those stations are gonna get five star. Perhaps they're gonna do six star. But for me, that is now standard practice. We need to go beyond that. It's about how can our buildings create health, healthy and well-being spaces. There's a thing called the well rating tool. So can we create spaces that goes beyond energy efficiency, sustainable materials, because we live in them, in them, and they impact environment. So we need to go beyond. And this is where biophilic design, and I'll say biophilic design itself won't push that agenda, but regenerative adaptive design combined with biophilic design will fully push this agenda to achieve way beyond standard practice or best practice sustainability. I hope I answered that okay. Very, you answered that beautifully and, and yeah, very delicately. Um, you also covered, I was going to ask you a follow-up too, but I think, think you covered I was going to ask if, and in the lecture you talked about um, drivers in, in modern times being mm. a political gain um, as, as key drivers uh, within the built environment. And I was going to ask if you thought that there would be um, a barrier specifically in those areas when introducing kind of biophilic, um, biophilic ideas for sort of large corporate and commercial interests and, and whether the way to move forward in that would be with like really persuasive uh, research. Do you think that would kind of help uh, jump that hurdle if there is one there? Absolutely. So, um... How can you say no to something if there's empirical evidence and it's been proven that it works? So, um, and this is quite interesting about Alexander's pattern language. I mean, it's, you know, it's been, there's a lot of, there was a lot of critique about it, but fundamentally now there's some new work and some 
um, research papers that came out, we can fundamentally see that those thoughts and thinking, the impact that's happening now in the environment, um, that's not adapting these patterns the way we do in design our buildings, the proof is in the pudding, if I can say that. So research could help us to do this, that we don't wait 30 years before we see what is the output. We can see it within you know, within a year and months, and we can apply the search to show that um, this new thinking of biophilic design and regenerative design um, is important. Now, um, and there's a lot of research going on, but yeah, you're correct. If we, if we can get big corporates, because it is a change in mindset, if we can get investment in research um, in this space, um, it's all about improve the health and well-being of us as humans and nature. Um, and we were talking just um, casually about mental health. Um, our mental health facilities in this country is appalling, to say the least. So why don't we design places and create places um, that will help with the improvement of mental health? I think COVID-19, COVID is now actually doing it. Yeah, I'm sitting talking to you in a small room. I've got a lot of plants behind me. Um, but you know how many people really struggle working from home because they're working in a storeroom or a makeshift space. These spaces are not good for us. We can't, we never thought of if I'm constantly in a, a small space or in a space that's not designed to trigger our senses that create health and well being. Um, uh, we we never really knew, or we, we now knew, it's like what is we can see the mental health issues with people working from home. So for me, it's a proof that show that we need to change the way we have designed our built environment. Um, I also, in the book, I started off to say that in the last century, the way we design our built environment is fundamentally um bad for, for us, the current environment. And we actually destroyed not just the physical environment, but also the soft environment, that, that space of, um, of I, I call it soul, you know, living, the, the feelings we've got um, it disappears because we live in a mechanistic world. Urbanization forces us to, force us to take on technology not, it's not all about technology. We still need um, the natural environment. We need textures. We need colors. We need timber. We need all of these things to make us um, healthy. That is who we are. We didn't evolve beyond that yet. So we need to adopt this critical requirement to create spaces because we know it's wrong. We actually see it happening all around us. Fantastic. Um, I've got another question here from Matt, uh, Phil. He says, wonderful work, Phil, congratulations. It's good to see the patterns placing a focus on working with place. By the same token, do you think one set of patterns can be applied to places at all scales or contexts? or should patterns in themselves be adapted to local conditions? Um, so yeah, but when I talked about these patterns, they, so there's, there's, um, it's like what happens in nature, there's hierarchies of scale. So uh, these 12 fundamental patterns is at the high level and down from that is core patterns um, that goes down to place. And these core patterns go then specifically to things like generative codes um, and so forth. So um, they can be adapted and work at place, but we always work up to those 12 fundamental patterns um, that address the global issue. So I hope that answers the question. I hope, I hope it does too. We'll see what our audience response is there. Um, we've got another question here from Yodan. Hope I'm pronouncing that right. Um, they say one of the characteristics of the large scale patterns in APL 
is that they emerge out of many small projects. Can you give some examples of such actions that can contribute to these large patterns that you described in your lecture? Um, so actions of or that contribute to these large, large, act, uh, large patterns. So if um, um, when I when I acknowledge um, then my acknowledgement to country um, to the indigenous people in the first slide, there's a little um, sketch, and it said core pattern, and it is about. Um, uh, it's about indigenous knowledge at that place and applying that knowledge on how to work with that environment is a good example how that support the bigger um, overall patterns. So, um, and projects at small scale. So for example, in my book, I use the whole Great Ocean Road and um, towns along the, the Great Ocean Road as case studies. So there's a full assessment of the towns, how the people and work with the environment, how the infrastructure work with the environment, and then it rolls up to the regional scale and to the bigger patterns. So, so yes, your your projects at local scale um, then needs to support the overall patterns, um, and and that's how the high. That's why hierarchy of scale is really important when we look at these things. What's important to it's understand that principle of centers that Alexander has got in his work. So a center is not like we think it's a, you know, a center in the middle of a circle, but it's the center of forces and attraction. So um, if we use these centers, um, I can perhaps say that could be small projects then build up then as the, as the bigger whole for that area and the region. So um, in essence, you apply these principles then to support the bigger pattern language, overarching um, um, fundamental patterns. Okay, um, so I've, I've kind of got a question or a, or a statement of understanding, I guess, for you, Phil. So when you say that it's uh, scalable, um, it essentially comes down to the point where even us just sitting in our houses um you know we can introduce plants into our environment we can open windows we can uh, try and expose ourselves to nature as much as possible um and then moving up uh by a factor it, you know it starts heading into things like green walls and then like master planning and stuff um do you do you find that people actually talk to you about these kind of scales often um, or what they can just do around their, um, you know, around their everyday living conditions? Um, yes, uh, good question. Um, although I'm talking, so this, my, the, the regenerative adaptive pattern language um, is, is looking at big scale intervention, but when you break it down um, and it comes to that small, um, let me just, Answer perhaps if you think of any ecosystem or a little patch of, of, of grass, let's say your garden, you go in there, um, there's this totally multiple interconnectivity between things. There's small, let's say there's ants, bees, a few insects, a few plants, there's the soils, and all of this work together as a living ecosystem. And that little ecosystem contributes to the bigger one because that's part of um, not just your garden, but let's say you're close to a nature reserve or everything around it. So when you, and not all of us can do things on big scale. So when you do a change at home, for example, you, you change, um, um, I mean, if you just got blank white walls, it's not good for you. Um, try to bring in patterns in nature, um, try to make sure there's more plants, you create a small ecosystem. And that then influence the bigger system because that's when, when we talk about wholeness, the one pattern um, that is the evolution, that's the pattern, uh, the whole, the universe, it's say that the universe, the earth, the biosphere, and goes right to the smallest molecule 
is all connected. So when you do something positive, it affects the rest. That's the Gaia theory by James Lovelock, by the way. So um, if you do something somewhere, um, it influences the rest of the biosphere. So yes, the, you do something positive at home, you will influence the bigger picture. Um, there's a very interesting Japanese saying, and I hope I say this correct. It's say, I think, I think it's Kenzen Ichino, that means examine the area around your feet. And why you need to do that is, as you walk, you will influence everything around you. Um, that's what happened from ecological thinking. So you could, in, although you can do something small, you will impact the bigger picture. Yeah, so I guess what I was getting at was that you know, while our lecture series is aimed at uh, industry professionals and students, mm. the viewers who aren't necessarily either of those two categories can still kind of, I, I guess, do their part in uh, in helping biophilic design to kind of take off or to just increase their uh, their own living conditions to be a little bit more uh, biophilically friendly, if you want to put uh, it that way. Yeah, absolutely. I think. We must start to demand, the, uh, not demand, demand by phallic conditions, um, because that's the only conditions that's going to give us create a well-being and health environment. So yes, um, um, people that's not in academia or professionals, just the normal person. I'm a normal person, by the way, too. I make a good coffee if I need to. <laughs> um, we can just demand that we need better environments. Um, don't accept um, homes that's been given to us that don't last long. It's got no character. It's got no, I mean, it's just actually shocking to see that we live in homes that's got no character. It doesn't support um, good design. It doesn't support a healthy environment. It doesn't support biophilia. Uh, biophilic design is crucial for us. Um, yeah. Well, touching back on these homes that don't support us and, and how you answered the question earlier about people noticing now in the pandemic when they're, they're locked in their small, small little box offices or they're, they're not able to do their work as they would be in their, in their space at home. Do you think that um, the, the health pandemic at the moment will, will push us then um, naturally towards like a more connected way or biophilic way of living and do you or do you think that um, because of kind of I mean I guess this is straying a little bit from the topic but uh, because we've been taught to kind of be more restrictive socially and things in this time that it will uh, I mean people are more wary of these sort of uh, connected connected kind of thinking um, I think COVID is um, pushing us towards many things in a quicker way. Um, I mean, one example is now we all work at home. Um, we've got this big, big offices and cities where we all had to go to work. <laughs> now we've got this corporates that's got this massive offices, but the people still work and deliver their work, especially if it's office work. I mean, it's, if it's like manufacturing, it doesn't work. But if you think in a corporate world where it's about, you know, um, um, it, it, we can work from home, we this is now a big challenge. Do we, why do you need to go back to an office? So office spaces probably will become, probably not total useless, but it's going to be another environment. We don't need to go back. I don't want to go back and, and be at uni every day. <laughs> I don't need to. <laughs> I would I would love to meet more people because I hate this little square screen that I'm looking at. But um, it shows that we can be really effective without impacting um, the environment by traveling to an office in Melbourne on the train or in the car. Now we don't need it. So I think we're going to see major and positive impacts from this anyway. Or we could see that um, we go back to the same old environment and mess everything up again. So for me, working from home um, and what COVID is doing, there's two instances. We actually got a research project at the Smart Lab that's been called 
um, creating happy places at home to work, to work in the COVID time. And we're currently investigating how the work environment and living conditions impact people's mental health at home. And what we want to do is, is then we would say, okay, what if you bring in plants, change the environment? Um, or do you bring plants? We find on a moment, a lot of people automatically just bring pot plants in now in the space where they work. Before they wouldn't even worry to do it, but now they do it. Why? And that shows us that that inherent connection to nature um, because we can't be out there now in the park and run and train and go to the beach, that inherent connection to nature by filia, we want it and that we bring it into our, office, our little home office or space so that we can feel better. <laughs> so, um, so the research already, we haven't got the results. There's a lot of work still to do, but it shows us that, yeah, COVID or this situation is really um, start to um, impacting the way we think. And I would say we, as architects, we need to be really thinking about this. Um, I mean, just think of, I call this, this cookie cutter homes that we all go, mass production. Um, it will have a big TV room, a rumpus room and things like that, but it won't have a good space to work in. We'll have a study that looks like a bedroom. It's probably small. Um, I'm sitting in this space because my internet connection, that's another thing, is our technology need to advance. But I've got a studio that's great and open. It's got, you know, it's, it's got textures and plants and that. that's where I want to work. But now we've got the small spaces that suddenly these homes that we live in, um, it's, it's not designed for this condition. You're not, I mean... It's interesting working. I love my wife and she loves me. I hope so. Um, but <laughs> no, she do. But the thing is working together a whole, it's a total di different dynamic. The kids are with you. The dogs are here. I showed you a little mic earlier. Um, it changed the way we do things, but um, we need spaces now that's actually more friendly. Happy spaces. How do you design it as an architect? What does it mean to design a happy place? Is it color? Is it toys? We, that is the question. So for me, environmental psychology and eco psychology that connects us to nature it becomes a fundamental element to think of now for architectural design. Um, because we are in, we're moving into an, an, an a new normal that we, we, we never thought of in design. So Perhaps this is where innovation is going to come up. New, great, innovative thinking in the world of architecture because of what COVID is, is doing to us in the moment. I hope so. And, and it's a nice message because sometimes, um, and, and there's, there's a sort of like dialogue about uh, all the negative repercussions that it'll bring. So it's, it's nice to think that. Um, or nice to look at it that way so that we can we can move on and, and improve and, and find better ways of doing things. Yeah. Well, we need to be positive sometimes. <laughs> definitely, definitely. Um, Phil, I've got another question for you. Um, I've touched on, I guess, the uh, approach of the lay person that may be listening or watching and listening. Um, but as architecture students uh, or architects, um, do you have any examples that you can think of off the top of your head of good biophilic design? Um, I'm kind of, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm thinking of things like uh, the Thorn Crown Chapel in Arkansas or uh, the Park Royal on Pickering by Woha in Singapore. Um, what other yep. ones might be good examples there? Um, so I guess in, um, there's really great examples in, in Singapore, um, you know, like some of the projects you mentioned, but sometimes um, the really great examples, and it's not necessarily that it's, because a lot of time we think biophilic design is just about plants and nature or green walls. That's not what it is. Um, biophilic design, there's 15 patterns of biophilic design that's specifically about how our sensory responses are. 
to things from nature. So like it's textures and geometric forms and all of that. So, um, so if you think of um, some of our really, I say older architecture, um, um, the Boyd's house, for example, simple, connected, um, beautiful timber being used, um, it, it creates a sense of, of place. So um, it's not always a big Wuhan new um, project that's got a lot of vegetation in it that's good biophilic design, but it's got all these other patterns and elements. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, that is one sim a simple example I can think of now that where you probably will never thought of that, that there's quite a lot of biophilic design elements in it, um, but the Boyd's house got a lot of it. Um, probably not all of it, but quite a lot subconsciously just happened by his design. Um, and and I think this is where um, perhaps in, in the early 60s, 70s, when we start to look at that architecture where we try to connect the indoors to the out and use natural materials is where we sort of automatically start to, to try to do that. Um, and and um and connect uh biophilic patterns without knowing it but now we consciously know the science evolved is that we need to do this so um yeah that's i mean that's a very simple example or not simple it is a it's a example that you probably wouldn't think as biophilic designed inspired but it actually got major elements of it in it So Philip, just to close up now, so we, we can, we're, we're right on time and right on schedule. Um, uh, is there anything, I know you've, you've talked through a lot of complex theory tonight and, and a lot of big ideas. Is there anything that you wanted to leave us with um, just to finish off? I don't know if you would aim it towards students or, or whatever you're thinking now, if there's something, I mean, it's hard to summarize everything you spoke about, but if there's something you wanna leave us with now. You can go ahead. Sure, that is difficult. You got another two hours for me? <laughs> <laughs> sure, why not? Um, why not? Why not? Um, <laughs> I think uh, it's um, probably just two points. The first one is is probably students, um, our, our students in architecture, is that um, for me, and I probably will get in trouble saying this, um, don't <laughs> always look up to what I call star architects and the big hoo-ha buildings and this amazing and massive awards for these designs. Um, that is not what real architecture is about. Real architecture is about place, how you can respond to the function that in needs of a place and understand the brief of your client because fundamentally it's about us as human beings, our habitats. This is probably the word I'm looking for. Don't create monuments, create habitats because that's what nature got. It's habitats, human habitats. If we see that space as a habitat, how we can, how you, how everything functions, my kitchen and my lounge and this habitat, and I share it. If you can create habitats, then I think you will achieve real good architecture. Um, that's for students. Um, for all my other colleagues and researchers and, and great people out there, I think we all need to embrace this new thinking of that we need to move beyond the current status quo because um, we are facing drastic times of climate change and impacts already here. And how will we deal with a new environment that we don't know? Because everything we design is based on past knowledge, past the history of climate. If you look at the engineering, if you design a bridge and things you design on your knowledge of, of all the past um, structures and strength and knowledges, now things is gonna change. So how can we be innovative to adapt to a new future that's, that's coming our way? And then my last words are, all of us, just whenever you make a design decision, 
ask yourself this. What legacy will you leave behind for future generations? That's it. Thank you. Well, that's perfect. <laughs> all right. Thanks very much, Phil. Um, that's all we've got time for tonight. I'd like to thank Phil again for joining us here in our last real lecture of the year. Um, I think that lecture was the perfect way to round off our theme of sustainability in architecture. Uh, so we hope that you've enjoyed the series and we'd like to encourage our fellow students and architects to consider what we can do in our industry in light of the current climate and biodiversity crisis. Architecture bears a profound responsibility and we implore you all to continue to explore and consider our environmental, cultural and social obligations. Um, now, as I mentioned at the beginning of the lecture, you can stay up to date with us on Facebook and Instagram and through our blog. You can see many of the previously recorded real lectures. Uh, from the whole real team, uh, thanks to everybody who has joined us tonight and another huge thank you to all of our guest lecturers this series. We couldn't have done it without you. Um, we're really thrilled that we have been able to bring you the real lectures again this year and we hope that you all stay safe and happy. To our fellow students, we wish you good luck for the rest of your studies this year and uh, hope you get through your exams well. Thanks everybody.